Well, good morning. Am I on good, Tim? All right, very good. I want to make sure y'all can hear me. Um, good to see everybody this morning. Um, all right, here they come. They're coming up. Follow the big kid out, kids. Any kids going to children's church? And everybody said, amen. Sorry, we got to pick on you, Melanie. We love you. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, good morning. I want to give you a quick reminder. Um, if you have not got your email to us, right now, media, the emails are going out next Sunday about this time, right at the end of church. Um, don't want to miss out on that. And if you don't get it to us, we can get it to you later. But that's starting next week, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about that next week. Also, don't forget that our Super Sundays on Sunday evenings are starting not this Sunday, not today, but next week, and we're going to be cooking out next week, so join us for that. And don't forget our Wednesday summer at the park. Um, just wanted to remind you of a couple of those things. We'll give you some more details coming out in emails and some other stuff here this week. So let's go ahead and dive in. I'm excited about today. Last week we started in Jonah. We were in chapters 1 and 2 last week. And last week we left Jonah as he prayed to the Lord from the belly of the gray fish. Jonah, he was running. And listen, Jonah wasn't running from the Ninevites. That wasn't the problem. He was running from the presence of the Lord. But what we saw last week was very simple. Last week, we saw that God's grace relentlessly pursues those that he has his eyes on. For Jonah, the unexpected grace that he received came in the form of a great fish. And Jonah, he ended his prayer from the belly of the great fish by saying, Salvation is from the Lord. Now, can you just pause and stop and think for just a moment about that? You are in the middle of a great fish, and you're praising God for His grace. Amen? That's some good news. I mean, grace doesn't always come the way we expect it and what it looks like, but let me tell you something. Grace always comes. Amen? It is always there. And that's where we're going to pick up this morning. At the end of Jonah chapter 2, so I ask if you would stand in honor and reverence of the reading of God's Word. We're going to go through chapter 2 this morning, and Jamie's going to change it for you. It's going to be up on the screens. Good news for you, it's only 10, ten verses in chapter 3. So, but we are going to pick up one at the end of chapter 2. Beginning in verse 10 of chapter 2, this is what the text says. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. And then chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now the Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh, listen to this, the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. And the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and proclaimed through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Let us pray. Father, I just thank you 
Thank you for this place. I thank you for the singing this morning. I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here and that are watching from a distance today. Father, we just thank you that we have this privilege to come together. Now, Father, as we come here, not to hear music, but to meet with you and to hear from you, Father. Open our hearts, open our minds so that we can hear wonderful things from your word. And Father, I pray today that you do the work that only you can do. If there's one in the sound of my voice that does not know Jesus, I pray that you do the work that only you can do. Convict them and don't let them leave this place today without knowing Jesus. We love you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> now God has done some great and amazing things throughout the history of the world. And listen to me. What amazes me the most about the things that God has done is God's method he chooses to work in time and history. This is what we see here in Jonah 3. Here, what we see is we see one of the world's greatest revivals take place in the city of Nineveh. And my question is, how does God choose to bring revival to Nineveh? Through the running rebel Jonah. And when you think about it, isn't this how God usually moves in the world even today? He moves through busted and broken people like you and me. And that's what amazes me. God chooses to use flawed messengers to carry and proclaim his perfect and flawless message. Listen now, we know God, we know how powerful and how awesome he is, and God could choose any way that he wants to. He could take a neon sign and put it up here right now. He could write a message in the sky. He could do something awesome to make us see and know that he is real and that he is God. He could do it all on his own. But the way God normally works is through ordinary, sinful men and women like you and me. Amen? Be astounded by this truth, brothers and sisters. Listen to me. Do you feel broken and messed up today? Do you see yourself as a flawed and sinful person today? Anybody else in here feel that way with me? Good. Because you are who God desires to use to carry his message. Amen? Be astounded by that truth. That's just amazing. Think about the number of times that we fumble around and we mess up his beautiful gospel. And how many times we fall short and still God chooses to take the most important message in this whole universe and entrust it to us. Wow. That's awesome. It's also pretty deep and pretty scary, isn't it? Be astounded. And not only should you be astounded by this truth, but the opening words of chapter 3 should stop us in our tracks. Jonah has done everything he could to run from God's calling, but God's relentless grace, it would not let Jonah out of his sight. And the opening words of chapter 3 say this, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Say it with me a second time. Amen and amen. Aren't you glad that God is a God of second chances? And as I look over my life, let me tell you how I know God. I know God as a God of third, fourth, tenth chances. Matter of fact, if we were to be honest with ourselves and look back over our life, we would see God as a God of countless chances. Amen? And think about this for a second. Let this truth just amaze you. If God was done with you after one chance, where would you be right now? Let me tell you where you'd be. You'd be dead and separated from the presence of God. You'd be with no hope. 
If God was a God of one chance, you would have no hope because we've all blown it. What a gracious God he is. And listen to me. As a gracious God, and he gives us his grace freely, as a recipient of God's grace through Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, you are qualified by God's grace to be his messenger. And so many people today think that only certain called people that have been trained or have been ordained have the responsibility to share the gospel. That God has been more gracious to them and not you. Or, this is what I hear most of the time, so many people think that they are not capable or equipped to share God's message. If you have been saved by grace, it is God's grace through Jesus Christ that qualifies you and equips you for anything the Lord calls you to do. And if you're a recipient of God's grace, you are qualified to be his messenger. So Jonah here, he yields to God's grace. And what happens when Jonah yields to God's grace here in chapter 3? Listen to verse 2 again. The second time, the Lord said almost the same, exact same thing he said to Jonah in chapter 1 when Jonah started running. He said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. Here in chapter 3, also in chapter 1, we're told that Nineveh is this exceedingly great city. And here in chapter 3, it says, It's three days' journey from one side to the other. Archaeology tells us that the city of Nineveh was about 60 miles in circumference. It's a huge city back in the day. And not only does the text here emphasize the size of Nineveh, but the text is also emphasizing the importance of Nineveh. Now Nineveh, listen, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire at the time. Of course it's big. Of course it's important. Do you see what's going on here? This is the very city that God called Jonah to go proclaim his message. Do you see what's going on? When you yield to God and His grace, God's going to give you an exceedingly great opportunity to do what He created you for. 120,000 people about to experience the wrath of God. Now listen to me closely. Some of you are going, yeah, okay, that's good for Jonah. Listen. You may never get the chance to speak to 120,000 people, and some of you are going, thank God. You may never see the waters of the Red Sea part. You may never preach like Peter in Acts chapter 2 and see 3,000 people come to the Lord. But hear me closely. No matter how big or small that opportunity from the Lord seems, Every opportunity from the Lord is an exceedingly great opportunity. Why? Because their souls hang in the balance. Because we're pointing them to Jesus. Yield to God in His grace, and He will place before you an exceedingly great opportunity to do what you were created for, no matter how small or how big it seems. Now, I hear the question right now in some of your heads. How? How do I do that? Anybody else got that question? Good, I see some heads. I don't see any hands, but I see some heads bobbing. How do I do that? It's simple. Speak the word to others. Speak God's word to others. There in verse 2, the Lord says, speak the message that I tell you. And I hear some people now going, well, of course, for Jonah that was easy. God showed up and told him directly what to say. Right? Don't you all wish that God would show up and just say, here's what I want you to say. Go say it. Wouldn't that be so easy? 
Listen to me. God has shown up, and His name is Jesus Christ. And God has told us what to say because, guess what? God wrote a book. We have His Word in front of us. Along with God's grace and along, <clears throat> along with the Holy Spirit within, God's Word is everything we need for salvation. It's everything that we need for life. It's everything we need to tell others about God's grace through Jesus Christ. Listen, we have God's thoughts. We have God's ideas, His promises. We have God's, God revealing Himself to us. And we have God speaking to us, telling us what to say to others right here. God's grace, it is sufficient. God's presence is sufficient. And God's Word is sufficient. And listen to me, brothers and sisters. We've got to stop making the excuses of why we're not doing what we are created to do. We already have everything we need. We have His presence. We have His promises. We have His Word. We have His grace. You are fully equipped to go out and be His messenger. Amen? So speak God's Word to others. And this one's out of order. So you have to skip a line on your notes and go down one. You'll see it in a second. I just wanted to let you know. Speak God's Word to others and share your story of God's grace towards you. It's called a testimony, brothers and sisters. You know what I needed? I needed to hear the story of somebody else for Jesus Christ to bring me to himself. I needed to hear that I was not the only person out there that was complete, completely and totally messed up. I needed to hear that no matter how bad I did mess up, my past couldn't define me. Only Jesus Christ could define who I was and who I am. I needed to hear from someone else their story of God's grace. And I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, there's somebody out there that needs to hear your story of God's grace towards you. You see, what I want you to hear from this is very simple. God takes all your past, all your experiences, puts it together in this beautiful masterpiece called you. And God puts you, His beautiful masterpiece, on display so other can see, others can see how awesome His grace is. God uses your past to show the greatness of His grace. You know where you've been. You know what you have done. And you know what God has done for you. And now, you are able to speak powerfully and effectively with passion because of God's grace towards you. Speak His Word. Share His testimony. And I want to ask you real quick, what is a testimony? So many people try to overcomplicate what a testimony is. Listen to me. This is what a testimony is. First, tell them who you were before Jesus Christ. And listen to me. All the ugly, all the bad, all the embarrassing things that you don't want anybody to find out about, be upfront and honest. Tell them the truth of who you were before Jesus Christ. Tell them how undeserving you are of grace. That's what makes God's grace so much better and so much more desirable than anything else. When others see how messed up you are and what God's grace did, tell them who you were before Jesus Christ. And then, tell them where Jesus found you. You know where he found me? He found me in a gutter. Dead, and spiritually separated for him, from him forever. He found me dead. 
And let me remind you of this real quick, brothers and sisters. I hear it all the time. I hear people, do you know Jesus? Have you found Jesus? I found Jesus. Let me tell you something. Jesus doesn't, you don't find Jesus. Jesus finds you. Amen? He finds you. He draws us to himself. Tell them who you were before Jesus. Tell them where Jesus found you. And then finally, tell them of the difference God's grace that Jesus made in your life. Let me tell you my quick story. I'm not going to give you any details. I just want to tell you real quick. I told you, Jesus found me in the worst place possible, in the gutter, where I didn't need to be. Jesus, he found me in the gutter, and he saved me to the uttermost. Amen? Jesus, he took me out of the outhouse, and he put me in the White House. Think about it. What did Jesus do for you? Is there somebody in your life that needs to hear that story? I guarantee they do. Let them see and hear your story of God's grace. Because God uses flawed messengers, you and me, to take and proclaim His perfect and flawless message to the world. Now, I thought about getting up here this morning, and some of you would have been like, Amen, thank God, why didn't you do it, brother? I thought about getting up here, saying Jonah's eight-word message, and then stepping down off the stage. Pauline would have been so happy, wouldn't you? I was, that's why I didn't say anything. I knew it was coming. What are y'all clapping for? Y'all better be at the altar today. <laughs> God's message to Nineveh. An eight-word message in the English. And for some of you, an even better news for you. It was a five-word message in the original Hebrew text. Well, when's our preacher going to get the message that he should speak five words and get down? Why y'all laugh at me? Here's the message. Jonah was to speak, found in verse 4. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The Ninevites hate Jonah. Jonah hates them. Great city, brutal men that do whatever they can. Here is your message, Jonah, that I tell you to speak. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. But again, let me remind you, we're getting to next week. Jonah's fear was not the Ninevites. Jonah's, why Jonah was running was he was running from the presence of the Lord. We'll get to that one next week. An eight-word message. And do you know what that tells me? It's, <coughs> excuse me. It's very simple. It tells me that there's power in God's message, not in the messenger. I can get up here all I want, and I can try to give you the best presentation possible. You can get somebody in here better to give a better presentation. I can't remember who said it. I think it was Charles Spurgeon. He said, you might get a better preacher, but you can't get a preacher to preach a better sermon because it's God's Word. You can't get a better word than God's Word. And that's what the Lord says. Jonah, here's my message. Don't try to embellish on it. Don't try to make it more palatable. Don't try to soften it up. Jonah, just speak my words. Do you see the simplicity of the message God gave him? Brothers and sisters, do we see the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here it is. Here's the beauty and simplicity of the gospel that we take to others. God, He is a holy God. We, we are nothing but helpless and broken sinners. And Jesus, He is the all-sufficient sacrifice. That's our message, is it not? That's what it is. Holy God, helpless sinners, all-sufficient sacrifice. His name is Jesus. That's our message, 
And we try to complicate what is so simple and what is so beautiful. Don't do that. Speak God's word. Share your testimony of God's grace to you and let God be God. Let God do the work of saving that person. Listen to me. It's not your job to save a soul. It's God's job. Your job is to proclaim the gospel. Amen? Why do we proclaim it? Because there's power in the message, not the messenger. And why do we do it this way? Why has God designed us to do it this way? Well, it's very simple. Listen to me. The gospel is sufficient in all things, and it's the gospel that changes lives. Not you, not your message, but God's word. So God sends his flawed messenger, Jonah, to proclaim his flawless message. Jonah spends three days going through Nineveh proclaiming God's perfect message. And brothers and sisters, what happens in Nineveh? They repent. Nineveh repents. Verse 5, And the people of Nineveh believed God. I'm coming back to that believed in a second. They called for a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. From the greatest to the least. Brothers and sisters, that's very simple. Everyone needs the gospel, amen? And I'm not talking about just those out there that don't know Jesus. Everybody in here needs the gospel daily. Because when we forget the gospel, we tend to do what? Sin. We need the gospel every day. Nineveh, they repent. Do you see what happened here? See, I said earlier, when you yield to God, not only are you going to get an exceedingly great opportunity to do what you were created for, but when you yield to God and His grace, you will get supernatural results. When you yield to God, something's going to happen. 120,000 people that hate Jonah turn to the Lord in three days of preaching an eight-word message. And brothers and sisters, I've got to ask the question, why today are churches around the world so ineffective in what we're called to do? It's very simple. It's because churches around the world today are full of people that are not yielding to God. If we would just yield to the supernatural God and believe that His grace is sufficient in all things, then we too would see supernatural results. And why did 120,000 people in Nineveh repent and turn to God? Because they believed in God. And I want to point out, it says, Nineveh believed God. This language here in verse 5 of chapter 3, it's the same language from Genesis 15, 6, where it says, Abraham believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It's the same exact language. Even Jesus confirms in Matthew 12, that the people of Nineveh repented and turned to the Lord. Yes. The people of Nineveh, listen to me. The people of Nineveh, how wicked and evil and horrible they were, are the same people that repented. But today... today, we can't get the same people that have been in church all their lives to repent of their sins. But this great city repented. And what does it mean that they believe God? What does it mean when the Bible says over and over, believe and you shall be saved? Listen to me. 
Belief is not intellectually believing that there is a God. I think I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. The devil and the demons believe that there is a God. They were with God before the creation. James 2, 19, the half-brother of Jesus says, You believe that God is one. You do well! Good job! Even the demons believe and shudder. Does anyone in here think that Satan and the demons, simply because they know that there is a God, they're going to be in heaven with us for all of eternity? I say this with love, but I say it. Knowing intellectual facts about God and about Jesus. Knowing intellectual facts is going to send a person to hell. Even Jesus says in Matthew 7, not everyone who calls on me, calls me Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does my will. On that day, many will call me Lord, and I'm going to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. Is it possible to know that there is a God and claim to belong to Jesus, but not know or belong to him? Yes. Jesus says yes. And unfortunately, that is going to happen. You could have been in church your whole life. You could have been around religious things and religious people. You could be full of religious activity. But if you are not in Christ, if you do not know Jesus, and if Jesus does not know you, you will hear those words. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Listen, what all this means is very simple. Believing God is much more than intellectual facts. It's a belief that changes your desires, your thoughts, your actions. It's a belief that makes you a completely new person. It's a belief that changes who you are. And any time there is true saving faith, there will be a change in a person's life. And according to the text, and according to Jesus here, this is what happened to 120,000 Ninevites here in Jonah 3. A belief in God that was counted to them as righteousness. Yes, the Ninevites. And I want to show you here from the king himself here in Nineveh. I want to show you a picture of true repentance. Look there beginning in verse 6. I'm going to read it to you again. The word reached the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne. He removed his robe covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. He issued a proclamation and published, through, published it through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let him not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in his hands. Now, I want you to notice right there in verse 6. What did the king do? First, he stepped down off his throne. Then what did he do? He took off his royal robe. And he sat in ashes and covered himself with sackcloth. The king's throne and the king's robe, they are symbols of the king's power, authority, and control. And here... Is the, in the text is a picture of the king of Nineveh surrendering his power, his authority, and his control to God. You see, when a person truly repents, first they step down off their throne and they surrender all their power and authority to the Lord. They also give up control of their lives to the one who created them so that he can make them need to go on one more, sorry. So that he can make them into what he wants them to be for his glory. Our problem, see if I can get an amen out of this one. Our problem, we don't like to be told what to do. 
Anybody married? <laughs> They're up here on the first row, not looking at each other, going, mm -hmm. yeah, we know. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I love y'all. Greg better get back soon so I can pick on him, right? <laughs> we don't like to be told what to do. We think we have the power to manage and live out our lives, and we think, we think we're in control of our lives. Did that describe every single one of us in here today? But what we need to realize is this, brothers and sisters. Two kings can't occupy the same throne at the same time. It can't happen. So my question is this. Who is it that is sitting on the throne of your heart today? Is it you or is it Jesus? The king of Nineveh, he gave up his throne of power and authority. He gave up his robe of control. And he turned from himself and turned from his sins. Verse 6, it says he covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. Verse 8, he said, let everyone, including myself, turn from our evil ways and from the violence we do. Listen to me, not only when you come to Jesus, and it's not that Jesus takes the fun out of life, he just makes life better. So don't hear this wrong. Not only are there things you have got to give up when you come to Jesus, but there are also things that you have to turn from. Amen? You've got to turn from yourself and your sin. As I have said before, to live, you must first die. Pick up your cross and carry it daily. The pathway to life is dying to yourself. As Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been what? Crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that lives. There it is for Paul. You have died to yourself. And he goes on to say, and now it's Christ who lives in me. There's the new life. There's the new you. Repentance. You give up your power, your authority, your control. You turn from yourself and from your sin. And all of that is great. But we all know we live in a world that as soon as we walk out these doors, Satan's going to provide a boat for us to get in to run away from God. Amen? That's what he did for Jonah. There are thousands upon thousands of things out there. God help our teenagers today. So many things that we could turn to. And unless you turn to the right thing, unless you turn to the right person, true repentance doesn't happen. True repentance only takes place when you turn to God. We can only come to God on His terms and in His way. Some people out in the world might call this narrow-minded. Well, I'll be as narrow-minded as I can be because my Jesus died for me. Amen? I mean, if the same God that created the universe is going to die and rise again and He's coming back, I'm going to listen to Him instead of the world. Verse 8 there, the king says, we see Him turning to the Lord. Let us call out mightily to God as we give up our power and perceive control and as we turn from ourselves and our sins. He's saying, let us turn to God. And brothers and sisters... That is the world's only option. And then I love what the king says in verse 9. Who knows? We're throwing it all off to the side. Lord, we're turning away from here, and we're turning to you, God. Who knows? Maybe God will turn and relent from what he said he would do to us. Maybe he won't destroy us. And look at what verse 10 says. We're going to talk about this in a minute. Verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Hold up. Brings in a big question here. 
Did God just change his mind? I thought he was an unchangeable God. Did the actions of a man, of people, cause a change in God? Because if God changed, he's not God. Amen? It's a deep question, deep theological question, brothers and sisters. We have to answer. Did God change? The answer is surprisingly simple. No. And yes, I'm going to explain it without just saying no. No, God did not change. Listen to me. God did not change. The hearts of the people changed. Think about this for a minute. God has and will always act according to His holy nature. We know God is a loving and gracious God. As 1 Timothy 2.4 says, He is a God that desires for all people to be saved. Does that mean all people are going to be saved? No. But He desires for all people to be saved. But God will not force His mercy and His grace upon people. So God is a merciful, loving, gracious God. That's who He is, right? Also, God is a holy, righteous, and just God. In other words, He is also the judge, and He's going to do what's right. So God is this merciful, gracious God, and at the same time, He's this holy, righteous, and just God. So God, in showing mercy and grace to Nineveh, God was acting according to who He is. Amen? If Nineveh did not repent and turn to Him, God still would have acted according to His nature because He is a holy, righteous, and just God. In other words, God had every right to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. God had every right as a holy, righteous, just God to do what's right to destroy Nineveh. As a merciful and gracious God, if they turned to Him, He had every right to forgive them. Do you see what's going on here? destroy, forgive, either way, God is still being God. There's no change in God. Whichever way He acted was according to His nature. So God did not change. When we look back at Pharaoh, who was it that kept the hard heart? Was it Pharaoh or did God make him that way? Pharaoh continued in his hard ways. Brothers and sisters, if we continue in our own ways, God's going to allow us to go into whatever he, we choose, right? And he will be just in allowing us to do it. God did not change. The hearts of the people changed. Every time throughout Scripture, this is the way it works. It's not God changing, it's the people. And so here's my question. How can God... Be merciful and gracious to people who don't deserve it. It's very simple. It's the promise the people were looking for in the Old Testament, and it's the promise that came in the New Testament. His name is Jesus Christ. Jesus, He took all the sin of all time, all our past, all our guilt, all our shame, and He nailed it to the cross. And what's so great about the book of Jonah, the lesson Jonah had to learn is this. God's grace isn't just for some people. Jonah, this proud Jewish man, he had to realize, God had to teach him, God's grace just isn't for the Jews, God's grace is for all people. Amen? Because if it was just for the Jews, how many Jews are in here? Notice the flow of the book of Jonah. 
God first had to do a work in Jonah, chapter 1 and 2, before he did a work in Nineveh, chapters 3 and 4. And God still works that way today. Listen to me. One of my favorite authors. Who is it? Y'all know who it is. Who's my favorite author? Huh? A.W. Tozer. A.W. Tozer says this. It is doubtful whether God can use a man greatly until he has first broke him. God actually rises up storms of conflict at times to, in order to accomplish that deeper work in our character. This is graduate level grace. Are you willing to enter this school? Are you willing to take this test? For he brings us through these tests as preparation for greater use in the kingdom. But you must pass the test first. I don't know about you, but getting swallowed up by a great fish, that was a graduate level class, wasn't it? Maybe even doctorate level. But that's exactly what God is doing in Jonah in chapters 1 and 2. Something is wrong with the man Jonah because when God said go, Jonah said no, and he took off running as far as he could from the presence of God. So God in his grace, he relentlessly pursues Jonah, ending with him being swallowed up by a fish called grace. You see, what had to happen for Jonah before revival came to Nineveh? What happened to ha had to happen to Jonah first is God had to break the man Jonah. And listen to me. He must first break us so he can make us into a usable vessel, vessel for his purposes and glory. You see... Lord knows this country and this world needs Jesus. Amen? And we pray for revival. We ask God to turn the hearts of our nation. We ask God to turn the hearts of our world back to Him. But here's the questions I need to ask you today as we're looking at Jonah and closing up. Are we willing to lay ourselves before God, step down off our thrones, and give up control to Him? Are we allow, willing to allow God to change our desires, our thoughts, and our actions? Are we, are we willing to allow God to first break us so that He can make us into who He created us to be? The first great awakening of the early 1700s, it started with men like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. And they allowed God to break them before revival happened. The second great awakening around the 1780s began with a man like Charles Finney. And he allowed God to break him. Even the evangelistic efforts of Billy Graham started with God first breaking the man so that he could preach the gospel to millions. And what I need you to hear today is this. We're praying and we're asking God for revival. But revival starts with one man or one woman that steps down off their throne, removes the robe, and gets very low before God. Here's my question. As an individual, are you willing to do that? As a church, are we willing to do that are we willing to let god first break us from our old ways so that he can mold us and use us and that's the invitation this morning and i ask you this morning because i don't know about you but every single one of us needs to be in here in here needs to be broken in some way today amen so I ask you this morning in this invitation, will you come join me at the altar? Ask God to break you from your old desires, your old thoughts, and your old actions. Will you ask God to do whatever it takes to break you so that He can use you? Brothers and sisters, that's not an easy prayer. 
That's a bold prayer. That's surrendering to Him and His will and His purposes. That's the kind of prayer that starts revival. And I know we all want revival to happen. But the question is, are you willing to allow God to do the work He needs to do first in you so that He can bring the gospel to the nations? So as Diane begins playing and the musicians come, I ask you very simply this morning, will you come join me this morning? We all want God. We all want this world to see Jesus because that's their need. Will you come join me during this song? And brothers and sisters, let's pray that God breaks us so that he can use us. That's what we need today. We need revival in this community. We need revival in our world. Will you come pray? Father, we love you. We thank you. And we praise you for who you are. Father, do the work that you only you can do. Because, Father, we want to see your glory shine. And we want others to know Jesus. We thank you and we praise you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.